siempre conectada con el mundo que me rodea y descubro que ya es una realidad. Vallarta Plus, el arte de viajar. Guanatosfm.net Los comentarios vertidos en este medio de comunicación son de exclusiva responsabilidad de quienes las emiten y no representan necesariamente el pensamiento ni la línea de guanatosfm.net Hey, how you doing, everybody? Lewis. Hello, Mr. Dr. Bruce. Mr. Bruce, Dr. Bruce, Professor you? Bruce. Man, you got so many titles. How you doing, young man? I'm keeping busy these days. Can you hear me well enough? Very well. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to have you. It's been a long time. I haven't seen you. Yeah, it's, I haven't been seen, actually. I had a um, uh -huh. liver transplant last oh, year, so I've been out of commission, and uh, I've just started to come back. Um, okay. I gave my first poetry reading in, in over a year, and oh. uh, I, uh, I don't know, I've been doing things in the community since then and uh, started, resumed my teaching, and uh, it's, been, it's been good. Yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming along, and I'm getting healthy, I think. So uh, no complaints at this end. So and not long ago was your wife's birthday, am I right? That's right. She uh, I won't tell you how old she was, but she's uh, she uh, we had a she had her birthday. I had mine uh, the week before. Right, right, so, right. Uh, close. Yeah. Good, so uh, <clears throat> listen it, up, um, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. I have a this this guest is a very special guest, extremely special guest, um, Dr. Bruce Meyer. Um, I first met Dr. Bruce, an uh, English professor, uh, through a mutual friend, um, Colin Carberry from uh, the the um, La Escuela Tecno la, uh, la Universidad Tecnológica de Nuevo León in, in uh, Linares, Nuevo León. That was back, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 200, 215 or 216. 20, 2015. And, uh, okay. Yeah. It was... Uh, it was uh, it was it was interesting because uh, our our buddy there, uh, the English professor, he invited easy twelve to fifteen uh, writers mm -hmm. from all over the world, and uh, and uh, but Bruce is 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 uh, Doctor Bruce is, is very uh, um, was very exciting in the way that uh, our relationship uh, started and continued because I happened to be on a trip in in Italy. And I ran across a friend of his, a, <laughs> uh, uh, another poet laureate, just like Canadian poet laureate, just like himself, George Eliot Clark. Clark. We were on the train, and I, you know, I, I started throwing names around like yeah, I know famous people too. Uh, <laughs> he goes, "Oh, you know Brucey?" I go, oh, "Excuse me, he's my buddy. I know him for over twenty something years." I go, "Oh, okay." Yeah, George and uh, I go back away. So uh, yeah, what's he. That? He looked me up in Toronto way back about 1979, and I got a call out of the blue one night during supper, and um, I was a, still an undergrad at that point, and he said, I, I wanted to meet you, and he said, I hear you're the guy in for, who does things in poetry in Toronto. And at that point, I was writing a lot and publishing a lot and uh, uh, organizing events and things. And uh, next thing I knew, George... Um, had hitchhiked to Toronto and he'd slept in ditches all the way under a, one of those reflective lumberjack blankets that they use for flaming forest fires. He'd slept in ditches and I organized an event for him at a pub, uh, like a gathering, not really a public event. And he still had had bits of, 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 of ditch uh, stuck in his hair. And um, I said to him, you know, you, you, you should run a comb through that, you know, get, <laughs> get, get, you look a bit travel worn. But um, anyways, it, uh, George and I have remained close ever since. And uh, that's, that's yeah. very good. That's very good. I, I, he was so, his eyes opened up. We had, we were on this train going to Pisa in Italy. He goes, you know, Bruce, you know, and he tells his partner, um, What's the name again? Uh, Giovanna. Oh, Giovanna Ricci. Ricci. Yeah. Giovanna Ricci. He goes, he knows Bruce. And like everybody in the in the train were looking at us. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's cool. That's that's that was that was outstanding. 
Well, uh, last summer when I was in the hospital, yeah, um, uh, I got this. My Carrie brought me this thing that had come in the mail. Excuse me. And George uh, had taken one of my poems and set it to music, or had it set to music by a composer. And it was kind of like a, so one of those things that got me through the, the, the blur of the medications and the, the haze of everything that was going on. I was uh, <laughs> drugged out of my skull. Uh, and um, um, it was, he'd taken a poem from one of my early books called Mavity Street. And he, uh, set it, he had it set to music by a, a jazz pianist. And then he did these broadsides of the score and uh, auctioned them off. And they, I guess it was the middle of September. I couldn't be there, but I watched from my hospital bed at the rehab Institute afterwards. And um, I watched as, um, as George had the poem presented and everything that they read it. And um, DB Jackson, uh, DD Jackson uh, performed it live. So um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a special moment. For, you know, wow. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was excellent, especially when you were recuperating. Good to see that. It, it's one of the things that got me through the whole experience. So yeah, I that, look that, forward that, to it. That that that's keen. That that's excellent. You know, I'm mm -hmm. I'm speaking to this uh, prolific writer, uh, which I consider a friend of mine and a friend of many other people that admire him. Uh, he's so really down to earth guy. You wouldn't believe that he's written what sixty four books. Seventy five actually. <laughs> It's it's seventy five now. Yeah, I'll tell you I'll tell you a funny story. I was lying in the hospital, and I'd <laughs> said to my wife early on in the delirium of the medications and after the re after the operation, I said I'll never publish another word. I'll never right. be able to write again. Well, then the books started arriving in the mail, and she said, "Did you write this?" And I said, I guess so. I've got my name on the cover. And it was a you know a book of short stories. And then along came a book of flash fiction. She said, Did you write this? And I said, Yeah, I must have. Yeah. <laughs> and then then uh, I got a letter saying, you know, we're publishing your new book. And then another one came and said, We're publishing another book of yours. And I was lying there. I thought, oh my gosh, what happened? When I was leading up to the uh, with liver disease. Right. What happened, and I wasn't a heavy drinker and I wasn't a heavy smoker, you know, uh, Lenati's aside, um, the um, uh, uh, apparently your, your liver poisons you, it pumps a lot of um, ammonia into your system and the ammonia goes straight to your brain. And I stopped sleeping for about five, six months. Wow. And I sat up all night writing, writing books. And there's still more books in my computer that I haven't sent out yet. That's so and all these books started tumbling out of publishers and things. And I, I thought, where are all, all these coming from? So uh, it's sort of given me a kick in the butt to start writing again and to sort of tune into things. And I, I am gradually tuning into the world again, which is nice, you know, so. But I don't recommend people going through a liver <laughs> transplant. It's uh, uh, as, a, as a... As a as a basically a mal um, uh, or an antidote to writer's block, you know. Right, um, right, right. Yeah, uh, writer slump. I think they call it sometimes. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, uh, Bruce's Bruce's books have been uh, translated, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read the list because it's very impressive. Um, have been published in uh, Canada, United States, United Kingdom, Ireland. Switzerland, Italy, Spain, India, Pakistan, China, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Chile, Mexico, Yemen, Greece, Australia, Denmark, Netherlands, and translated into French, Spanish, Italian, Dutch, uh, Danish, Hindi, Chinese, Urdu, Bangla, Greek, and Korean. Anything else that I miss? I think that's about it. There's... Um... Um, there was a, there was a Bangla book that came out um, again last year when I was in my delirium, and there was a woman in um, in living in Nova Scotia, Farzana Nashampa, did a wonderful translation of my work in Bangla, and I can't read it because it's all in a different different script and everything like that. But apparently, while I was recovering, I'd go on Facebook and uh, people in Bangladesh on street corners were holding up the book this Bangla translation, and everybody was reading it. Th things sold out several times over in, in Dhaka. And I said to her, 
you know, what what's happening with this? She says, everybody's reading it. I, I thought, wow, because you know, in Canada, nobody, you know, gives a hoot, you know, certain thing. It, it's it, it's kind of, yeah, yeah, you wrote a poem, certain thing. Um, right. You sort, of, you sort of live with that here. So it's, um, um, we're coldly indifferent and just cold most of the time. So <laughs> in Canada, so. It's um, extremely, I mean, impressed. I have like, um, <clears throat> my books are not translated per mm -hmm. se by a company. Your I books make, are quite good. Know, I, 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 like, I do like your books. Yeah. I'm, I've, been, I've been fortunate to have a couple of my English books translated, uh, by myself that is, into Spanish, but not the book entirely, just a couple of poems on anthology, anthologies or, and or or short stories, but um, uh, your your impressive track. Let me just read something here about uh, about uh, Dr. Dr. Bruce um, certificate of post doctoral studies, McMaster University, nineteen ninety, PhD, modern British poetry, McMaster University, nineteen eighty eight, Masters of Arts, English University of Toronto, Bachelor of Arts. Honor English Renaissance Studies, Victorian College, University of Toronto, and a host of other, um, um, I'm not saying uh, courses, but certificates and, and honorary degrees that I know he's received. Um, this gentleman is such an inspiration because uh, back, in, I believe, in 19, in 2000, 2016, when we were together, he took it upon himself to write a book of uh, Linares, the book Linares, uh, which is about the uh, the town where we were in Nuevo León, and he and wrote each 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 presenter or each guest uh, from whatever country they were from. He wrote each a poem. Amazing, he did that. That was while and I was impressive. there in the week. Yeah, and um, I, I, Luis. I have to thank you again. I, I owe you a debt of gratitude. You got the book published, you know, um, with um, Accento um, Editorio. Accento, yeah. And I, yeah. I, it's 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 still uh, apparently. I was talking to Colin. He says that book is still like you know, people are still talking about it. So, so you know, it's um, um, yeah. It was it was it was it was kind of like a symphony fantastique, you know, um, um, flying in through a hurricane, which we did. Richard yeah. Green and I flew in through the hurricane, and the guy who picked us up, his name was Angel, and then leaving, I Angel drove me out, and I flew back through another hurricane, and there was like a, a hurricane was in Toronto, and um, you know, it was one of those things that I thought, I, you know, it was just, it, it just can't, it was just one of those moments when yeah, everything right. happened. It was a serendipitous thing. So, uh, yeah, so, and I, but I owe you a debt of gratitude because you were the guy that got it published, so. Uh, yeah, well, Accento Editoriales here in Guadalajara uh, were, were very receptive, receptive to to the, the fact that who you were, I have to explain to them who you were, they were very excited about it. There's another book of, of all your books. I, I have like four or five, but um, there's another book. It's not a book, I'm sorry. It's a it's a an interview you conducted mm -hmm. with fourteen Canadian writers, in their words. Was that a, a podcast interview book? They were um, they were published in magazines here in Canada. Oh, okay. I, I, Brian O'Reardon and I did the book together, and um, um, we were sort of you know young bucks at the time. I think we started off interviewing people in 1980, and uh, the book was published in '85. Oh. by House of Anansi Press, which is a major press here in Canada. And, but we published them in all sorts of different magazines. We published them in uh, like the um, Odescant, which was a major literary magazine here. And um, they, they started appearing all over the place. And one of the things people we interviewed was Leonard Cohen, when no one was talking exactly. to Leonard that? Cohen. <laughs> and then no one was talking to him. And Irving Layton, who is a Canadian poet, who we interviewed, after we did Irving, he uh, talked to Irving. Um, Irving said, here's Leonard Cohen's address, go and talk to him, you know. So we went down to Montreal and we interviewed him. And while we were there interviewing him at the end of the, um, of the evening, um, Leonard um, said, would you like to hear some music? He, and he says, I'm feeling kind of holy. And so we said, sure. And um, 
he sat down, played a couple of things. And then the next thing we knew, he said, I'm working on a new song. And he had the new song, he played a couple of bars. And it was the second and third verse of Hallelujah. And he says, I've got a first verse coming along. And he says, I don't know. And he started playing like the third and fourth lines of the song wow. of, the, of the verse. And my friend Reardon looked at his watch and went, like that to me. <laughs> like we should be going, you know, sort of thing. And Leonard Cohen stopped playing and he put his hand on the on the strings and said, looked at a Reardon and said, You don't really care for music, do you? And that was and the line made it into the song, you know, and I I I, and we were there, and, and it, it, that line came from the fact that we were wow. looking at his watch at the wrong time, and he was trying to tell me we should be going. So, um, but the book that that book has been the most quoted book oh, in Canadian okay. literature. Everybody who's doing uh, studies of of the writers in there in that book, um, um, you know, they have to go through that book. They have to talk about what the authors said, and the authors bless them poured their hearts into their responses yes they they we, we sent them the transcripts and they they made sure everything was perfect and yes that they they flushed it out um and everybody who was in that book and a succeeding one we did in 1991 called lives and works um everybody who was in that it represents a major period in canadian literature um it, it represents a period when can lit was firing in all cylinders and you had these giants um if you drive around toronto now right. there are statues in parks dedicated to a lot of most of the writers in there wow. and you know met wendell McEwen and al purdy and um milton acorn has a statue to him in the square right. in charlottetown prince edward island and um you know to us they weren't bronze they were they were just the people we chatted with, you know, I mean, who happened to be writers. And, um, but that's considered the golden age of can candlelit now. So what, what a unique experience to have, uh, all 14 of them available and to have it documented, uh, you know, because, uh, that, like you said it, you, you, ha you should go through that. We should go through that, uh, as writers, poets, and, uh, it, it's just, it's just a perfect example when you that an individual like yourself, I don't think I don't know who else would have done it that they trusted to get uh, for you to get their input on on that on that uh, on on the, uh, on the on that profession and uh, and then so well done. It, which is, that's the real. That's the real. <laughs> well, I think I think it was a case of angels rushing in where where you know fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Yeah, you know? yeah. um, we just we just called up the the authors, and um, you know the other thing is can let poets were considered a kind of like the outside cast, like you you didn't want to go near a poet. They weren't criminals and they weren't dignified members of society. They were kind of somewhere in between. Yeah. That was kind of considered. Um, not polite society, and um, but not necessarily criminal society. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, we we went and talked to them. I remember going to sneaking off when I was a t teenager to poetry readings at a bar called Grossman's Tavern in Toronto, and Milton Acorn was there, and Irving Layton, and Eli Mandel, and a number of others. And my father caught me coming home, and he says, "I says, where have you been?" And I said, "Well, I." I I've been at a poetry reading. He says, they're going to turn you on to drugs, aren't they? I said, no. I said, they've turned me on to something else, which is poetry. And I said, it, it, it's it's really great. You know, what a world. Like, <laughs> but, you know, it, it was um, looking back on it. You know, I think I think I was just an audacious teenager. And so was a Reardon at the time. And, um, um, you know, I think we couldn't take no for an answer. You know, um, Leonard Cohen, we called him up. And um, uh, Irving Leighton had given us the number, and um, there was uh, a man answered. And I said, is Leonard Cohen there? He says, Leonard Cohen's been here? And I, and I said, well, is he there? Yeah. And the man turns around and starts screaming at his wife. You told me you would broken it off with Leonard Cohen. And there's, there's a screaming match takes place for about 20 minutes, and I'm on long distance. And in those <laughs> days, long distance to Toronto to Montreal was pricey. Right. And I'm on the phone listening to all this, and the um, uh, uh, 
so eventually I, I hung up very, very quietly. And about an hour later, I get a call from Leonard Cohen. He says, you're looking for me. I said, yeah, would you be interviewed? Yeah, but don't call me again. Yeah. And we got to Montreal and we thought, well, is he going to, we took the train down to Montreal, which was pricey. Because remember, we're students, so we don't have any money, you know, and Canadian trains are, are, are expensive. So we got down to Montreal and um, we showed up at Cohen's house and we knock on the front door. There's nobody there. But his house had a low second story. So I jumped up and started banging my fist on the, on the <laughs> window of his house. And all of a sudden, the front door opened. And um, uh, we walked in and there was a stairway and the door closed behind us. And there's a stairway going up right in front of us. And I bent down, looked up the stairs. And there's Cohen standing at the top of the stairs. And I said, I said, how did you do that? And he says, doors on a string. I said, like a kite. And he says, <laughs> yes. And the kite is a victim. And we had this interchange of quoting lines from his poems. And eventually he said, come on up. And um, there was a, char a guy who was a character in, in Beautiful Losers um, who plays Rosengarten, or Rosencrantz in the Beautiful Losers. And his name was Mort Rosengarten. And he was there. And he sat in the interview. And about halfway through, he said, Leonard really likes you guys. I think I'll be leaving. Oh, really? And um, the, the interview went from there. And I think the Leonard Cohen interview was what sort of catapulted us forward okay. because Cohen hadn't talked to anybody for years. Uh, he'd been in his monastery in California. He had come out with Death of a Ladies Man, and Death of a Ladies Man had sort of crashed and burned. It was like a Jungian psychology book where you have the female on one side and the male voice on the other. Okay. And when you closed the book, they met and they made love or something like that. And it didn't work. You know? <laughs> and it was panned by the critics. Um, but then at that when we saw cohen he had merged from the monastery and he was working on a new book called the book of mercy and that was when he became the holy secular man yeah he became the the man in black you know with the fedora and the yeah the, yeah uh, everything and he was reborn as the leonard cohen we know now and he was working on the first big song from the reborn leonard cohen which was hallelujah as we were there wow so, he, yes. He, he um he 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 Leonard has imp now impressed me and, uh, and a host of other people, but he's he reminds me of one of those figures in literary history, like a uh, like a for some reason for me Lenny Bruce, uh one of those yeah. people had the following, and 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 people would just could not get enough of him. Yeah, Leonard. well, he uh, I mean I I met up with Leonard later on. Um, yeah, I forget where he was. He was in a bookstore or something. I, and I said to him, hey, you know, thanks for sitting and for an interview with us. And he says, well, thank you. He says, and I think he felt that it was kind of like, and Irving Layton said this as well, that was the key right. that opened the second half of Leonard's life. You know, right. so, Wow. Yeah. But, well, but what a volume that is. And uh, yeah. it, it's, on, it's on Amazon. People can still get it on Amazon. I'm, I'm I think think so it was it was sold by house of an Nancy press and if it's if it's not on amazon you can probably find Eight it through books, through through yeah. book finder or something right. like that or one of the second hand services but um yeah that was uh, 1985 that came out it, know, it's so. a must it's a must for for any writer especially poets uh, and it's it's still going i mean it's you know people are still reading it so uh, yeah yeah like i, I said, wish i, 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 I wish really got bought residuals a, i always really bought a copy yeah, I wish there were residuals involved, but uh, yeah. not quite. Yeah, sort of thing. But uh, it'll it'll still help a lot of people to understand, I guess, the the mind of these of these great writers because that's that's what they are. They, they're well known. They they're great in the sense that um, you can always learn from them. To me, that's a great writer. If I can learn something from you, and I'm not talking about technique, I'm talking about that what you pour in into your work and I can get something out of that. You're a great writer because you have affected me and I'm not well, going to copy from you, but, I, but I'm going to keep you in mind. Well, well Lynn, um, Gwendolyn McEwen, who was in that book, um, sort of nurtured me, you know, and so did Milton Acorn as well. The two of them had been married at one point and they divorced and it was a huge, messy divorce. And both of them ended up, 
in inst being institutionalized because it was so horrible in their minds. But the um, I remember um, uh, Milton Acorn taking me out after a poetry reading says, "Mr. Meyer, you can't do that," and banging out you know beater and beats and things like that on the table in a, in a restaurant and people looking over thinking, "What's going on here?" Um, and then Gwendolyn McEwen. Um, uh, I interviewed her, and we interviewed her, and then she would ride her, her little bicycle around the university district, just at the edge of the university. And um, she one day she said, come on in for a cup of tea. So we went in for tea, and um, she was wonderful. I would drop in to see her all the time. And she, she I, I did, did a photograph of Milton Acorn that she said was the best photograph ever, and it's in the book. Okay, and uh, it was on her desk the day they found her after she died. But the thing about um, about uh, Gwendolyn McEwen was she said to me one day, and I feel touched by this and sort of bragging. But she <laughs> said, she said, you know, you're the child that uh, I would have had with Milton. Wow. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so I consider Acorn and McEwen to be my sort of. <laughs> Poetic parents. I have real parents, and I love my love my real parents. Adored them, um, but um, my mother's still alive. So yes. you know, my my she had a birth birthday. Now, she just ninety four. She just yeah. ninety four, yeah. um, and she's still lives on her own. She's got all her marbles and everything. But she, um, I mean, that to have poetic parents is important because it means that there's a continuum at work, and one of the ways I think. And this goes back to how we met. One of the ways that continuums are created is when younger writers meet older writers and right. they can talk to them. And um, I've always tried to foster that, whether it's setting up reading series here. And I ran a, an intensive workshop in Toronto every July 1st weekend for years. Wow. Um, and, you know, it, just trying to get uh, foster a sense of dialogue between writers and the problem is that the dialogue's breaking down now. And, you know, I don't know how to reach back. Um, you know, uh, someone said to me, uh, you know, says, says I said, I, I wish you, she was a new poet laureate of Barry. And I said to her, you know, I wish, wish you got, wish you get in touch with me. You know, we'd love to chat about poetry. She says, oh, I, I, I don't know what I'd say. She says, <laughs> says you're, you're legendary. And I'm going, no, no. I, you know, I said, you know, there's stuff you can learn, we can talk about, you know, and I, I'm not don't necessarily have to teach you all that I'm just, just to rap about the art. But that's what Colin was doing in Lenates. He was trying to create a sense of dialogue, not only um, between, you know, established writers such as yourself and, everything, uh, and Richard Green and a number of others, but and also George L. Clark, but to create a sense of dialogue between writers from different places. And that's basically how we met. And then two Lenatis came out of that because you could just feel it <clears throat> during the, the, um, the uh, Congresso, you know, you could feel this sense of, um, I suppose the, um, the energy of, of people sharing ideas and talking yes. about things and talking about poetry and then talking to students and everything like that. Yeah. And he, I, I, Colin said to me, well, I modeled it on your, on your, um, the, the thing that you did in July 1st every year at uh, Hart House in Toronto. So, you know, I it, I think that there's, the, the, that's how literature exists. It, it exists as a kind of continuum, but it's a conversation as well. Hey, we, um, that that connection that we developed in Linares uh, yeah. still exists today because I know that when uh, when one of us that had attended those those uh, international congress of uh, mm -hmm. language and literature. When one of us has a birthday or one of us writes a book, uh, I see how we all congratulate each other. And that's really keen. As a matter yeah. of fact, I even, I remember um, a, a recent book that I did, uh, memoirs, uh, Sharon and Mary, uh, Mary Ann and John Hart, Jack Hart. Mm -hmm. They all helped me out with my, uh, with this book, that I, my, my latest book. So we still have that 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 connection. It's great. You can call on me anytime. You know, I mean, I, I'd oh, be I happy, to, I'm happy to lend a hand. So, um, yeah, one of the people who contacted me in the hospital was Karen Schenfeld, and yeah. I, she said, "Oh, Carrie says I wrote to Carrie. She says she says you're 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 very very ill," and um, I talked to her on the phone at Karen Schenfeld, and she said to me, "You'll you'll get better." And at that point, I thought, I don't even know. 
just going to die here, you know, sort of thing. And because um, uh, liver transplants are just about the worst thing I can imagine. And she says, no, you're going to get better. And it's it's the sense that I think we're still there for each other. I yes. think part of us are, is still we're still standing in the bar there and we're or we're having steak. You know, like I wrote a poem on steak for you. I know, and, I noticed that. Yeah. And you know we're, we're 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 all eating together and we're all having a conversation. It was, great, though. It, it, it was it, part of fun. What a what a uh, what what a way of meeting uh, that uh, you can still carry on after all those years to still carry on as friends, encourage mm -hmm. each other, and you know and and seek advice if necessary from each other. Yeah, so I, that was really outstanding. Uh, our meeting. Uh, meeting the little town, meeting the townspeople. I've been back a couple of times after. And it is a pretty small town, and people still remember me for crying out loud. You know, they call me uh, Professor, Profe for crying out loud. They like, well, I'm not a professor, but uh, yeah, Louis, all right. And but it, it, it's it's good to to feel that you you did somehow you had an impact in that small community. Yeah, there's there was a, a guy, a student I met, and he was working in a dress shop down the street when my daughter was with me. Remember, she came to the the second uh, one I was at, yeah, and, I uh, and and Juan Carlos, and I'm still in touch with Juan Carlos. And um, he he said he couldn't decide whether he wanted to be a poet or a filmmaker, and I think he's into film now. I, I kind of <laughs> uh, just I lost one for our side, but um, but he um, uh, I kept in touch with him, and my daughters kept in touch with him every people and i'm still on facebook with a lot of the students you know and um you know it, it's it's encouraging to think that it's even connected. even if they don't become insanely yeah, committed yeah, poets yeah. Yeah. they're still the having, having connections and it's the creative mind that that's at work behind it all so yeah, yeah um and i know soon you'll be working out or reviewing uh but, that book that colin uh, uh is gonna I've, send you I'm writing a forward for it. There's an anthology. Oh, yeah, I want, I'm going to the forward or the, or, yeah. or the another part, of, another portion, another part of the book. Yeah, but a drum roll. I remember, I remember him telling. He was so excited. You know, I hope I hope he accepts it. Let's hope he accepts it. Yeah, well, drum roll because um, everything's there. I think you're you're you. I mean, you're definitely in and everything. Uh, but he's actually taken poems from all the people. Yes. Um, and he's had them translated into English, or he's translated them in English himself. And, you know, it was an international conference. I mean, uh, yes. I, I know he's quite close to Munyam uh, Afakar, um, yes. you know, from, from Iran and so forth. Um, he's translated them all into English, and um, he's he just sent me the manuscript today. So I'm going to write a forward for it, you know. Oh, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of nice because now there's a souvenir. Now we have to go back and launch the book, you know, <laughs> um, you know, have a reunion or something like that. Yeah, a reunion you know? for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, but um, anyways, I mean, Richard Green, to tell you about the connections, Richard Green, I've talked to his class a number of times at the U of T. Um, and um, uh, he teaches creative writing at the U of T. And um, he wrote a blurb for my new book which is this one. This is called Church Grammar. So I, oh, okay. There it is. Church Grammar. Church there grammar. it is. Yes, Church I, grammar. yes I, I'm familiar with that. There we go. I know that you can see this. It's in, it's in focus there, but there you go. That's the cover. And I launched it on April the 22nd. And, um, um, you know, it's just, it, it was great to come back because, you know, I was standing there reading in a, in a <laughs> mask and everything like right. that because I'm, I'm immune compromised. You know, I can't go to crowds and things, but but, you know, um, it was just nice to get out, you know, and to uh, to be there. And they, it was uh, published and launched at a little church uh, called St. Thomas Anglican Church, in, in which is on the campus of the University of Toronto. And it has the most amazing um, wood carving. Uh, the whole chancel is just, you know, beautiful oak carving and um, everything like that. So it was a gorgeous venue. And the great sound system and everything like that too. So it was uh, it was nice. It was uh, and uh, it was my welcome back to reality sort yes. of event. You know? um, uh, I, let me ask you something on, on the professional level, as far as writers, because uh, I get quite a few that that visit this this program <clears throat> because of my diverse uh, uh, selection of of guests. 
But let me ask you something about um, criticism. Mm -hmm. um, with with the degree of books that you have written, um, how how is it that you um, how do you how is it that you handle criticism? Because for some of us, we take it with a grain of salt. All of us are traumatized. Me, it doesn't really matter because I'm doing it for me anyway. Well, I, I was fortunate to be mentored at graduate school by Paul Fussell, who wrote The Great War in Modern Memory, who was this major American critic. And um, um, he, um, uh, I mean, I, I walked up to him after a, after a talk he'd given at McMaster University, and he had a couple of facts wrong in this in this talk. And I, I pointed out to him and I said, you know, you can contact me. I, I we were both working, he was both talking about World War II British poetry, which is what my, and I was, the my doctoral thesis was on post-World War II British poetry, but I had to do the preliminaries. And um, I remember talking to Fussell, and so we kept in touch. Fussell wrote a wonderful essay about um, author's big mistake, it's called. And he says there's certain things authors shouldn't do. They shouldn't, when they get a bad review, they right. shouldn't write to the reviewer and sound off because that just sounds like they're crackers. And they shouldn't thank a reviewer for a good review. You know, I mean, I've, I've mentioned to, to George L. Clark on, yeah. on the sly, I said, that was kind of nice of you, you know, sort of thing. And, and George, you know, but... <laughs> but I hadn't, you never respond to a bad review. It's called author's big mistake. And looking back on it, you know, and this, and this is something writers should know. Um, criticism is useful if it's constructive criticism. Um, I mean, I, I work as, as a creative writing teacher, but I'm not really so much a teacher as I am a, a t an engineer, a, a technical engineer. I it's kind of like building race cars. Okay. I try to get an extra five miles an hour okay. out of what my students write. And I say, have you considered this, 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 and this? And that's something that with Caesar's thumb criticism that you don't get, um, you know, good or bad. And the, the worst kind of criticism is Caesar's thumb. The second worst kind of criticism is your grandmother. You know, that's lovely, dear. You know, <laughs> you read them a poem, you know, and you just, just made the universe open up and they go, that's lovely, dear. You know, that, you know, that you could have, you could have read the shopping list to them. They'd say, yeah. that's love. You know, um, that's useless criticism. The best kind of criticism is engineering criticism. It's, it's engineering response that there's a kind of a, a, I sound like a technocrat, but there's a kind of technical language in poetry and the technical know-how there's engineering it's, it's the engineering of the imagination that goes into a poem yes and to be able to respond to another poet on a technical level take talks to their artist rather than to their content um i i've told i told you know friends of mine when i've been editing their books ditch that ditch that poem why and i can tell them why Okay. I can, it's not that I like it or don't like it. It doesn't work because you did this, 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 and this. Oh, I see. And I suggest that if you try to save it, you can do this, 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 and this. Um, and sometimes they go, no, I like it that way. And <laughs> that's the one that always is the thorn that draws the readers, <laughs> the critics' attention if they get a book review. And they go, oh, I should have listened to it. I should have, yeah. But um, uh, the, the thing about um, about criticism when I'm teaching a class is that um, I will try to find different solutions. W.H. Auden, the British poet, said that writing is problem solving, and it's the sense of trying to find a solution. If you see a problem on the page, um, as Irving Layton called it, a shit detector, but it's a little bell that goes off in the back of his mind, okay. of the reader's mind, that something is wrong. And you can just say, I don't like it. Or you can say, there's a problem here. And I, I, I've seen a problem. Maybe they don't see it themselves. Exactly. And one of, the, one of the things authors should rely on is a second pair of eyes. Now, when you're writing a very technically advanced po poetry type of poetry, it's hard to get a good trained second pair of eyes. You know, it's, it's the old adage, good help is so hard to find. Um, but, you know, it, it's the sense <laughs> that... that um, that I, I talk to my students about this. And um, I, I play around with things. And 
on a larger scale, I had a student at um, University of Toronto by the name of Antonia Fachaponte, a very gifted young poet, but she didn't know how to organize a manuscript. And she sent me this, these poems and it had been rejected by a couple of presses. And uh, I said, okay, this is what's wrong with it. Cut out all the photographs. Nobody wants the photographs. Cut out the the biographical stuff about you going to university. Those are university poems. Those are undergrad things. Say goodbye to them. Okay. And she said, well, what's left? And I said, watch. And I sent her, well, next day, I sent her the reorganized poems. And I'd taken the book, it's, which is about immigrant Italian immigrants coming to Toronto and cooking and what they make and how they long for what they could how they could cook things at home as opposed to how they could cook things in canada and um i said you know i said there's something else going on here and i parted the book into two sections um it opens with an introduction an overture in the middle of it there's kind of like an introit okay which is an, or an intermezzo and then finally there's a finale and i turned it into a two-act opera and the book just went, took off. It had, like the critics wow. said, this is, this is great. And it was all her work. I, didn't ch I hardly changed a word, but it was all on how I organized it. Yeah, and it's, I organized. it's all in the shuffling. And it's, it's a principle that I like to adhere to when I'm, when I'm editing my own books. It's called orchestration. And um, in the case of church grammar, um, I, I sent the stuff off, the poems off to uh, my editor, David Kent. Um, who's who's actually a, a brilliant and sort of really underappreciated editor here in Canada yeah. at, at St. Thomas Poetry Press. And he sent me the book and it was all edited. And I said, wow. I said, I see, I love what you've done. And he says, the poems were telling me, and this is a principle we both admire. It's the principle that the poems tell you what they want to be. Okay. And a good editor or a good critic is someone who right. listens to the poems. And not enough... People, people are expect the poem to do what they want to do. Well, rather right. than what the poem wants to do. Exactly. exactly. And it's like kind rounding a square. It's like rounding a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> and it's, it's not gonna work. But right. if you listen to what the poems say, it will work out for you. It will it will, it will work, it will come to life. It takes on a life of its own, actually. Yeah, and it works on the poem level, it works on the line level, it works on the book level and everything. Yeah. It's a principle that you can, pardon, excuse me, that's scalable, and you can apply it to different, uh, just about every different um, level of the book. So, it, anyways, it, it appears as of um, sometimes, as 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 writers, especially individuals, well, like myself that have never studied literature, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, I, I took on initially when I first started with feelings, emotions. Which is fine in, in 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 some poems, but it's not always just my emotions. Sometimes, like you said, it's, it's, it takes on a life of its own. That later on, after it's published, after you say, "Oh wait, I did this. I I, made it, I committed an error. I should have just left it the way it was and not so no many so many word changes so it can fit a certain pattern." Yeah. But let, let it take a life of its own, and that's something that took me years. To actually learn and uh, well, it's interesting that the that emotions have to sit on something. This is something I I, I was tough for me to learn, you know, when I was when I was apprenticing that um, uh, that it, it's something you see happening in Heaney and you see it in, in Philip Larkin, for example, and it's not even the the form of the poem; it's the fact that the images and the feelings and so forth have to sit on some sort of realistic base. Um, uh, so, so eventually when I did a whole book of sonnets for my wife, whichever, a couple of publishers said, yuck, huh? just to the idea, you know, we don't want to read your love letters sort of thing. Um, and th that book sold out and it got rave reviews. It was won a couple of awards in, in both the, in all in the States, you know, um, and uh, it was called The Seasons, but all the poems, they're sonnets. It's 150 sonnets, or 100, yeah, 100 sonnets, sort of like um, um, like Neruda's Cien Sonetos de Mor, um, that there's 100 sonnets in the book, 
and uh, they're all to my wife, but they're all seated on something. They're all um, based on some in some sort of rea concrete reality. So that you know, when I talk about you know going through life with her, we're walking through her hometown of Elliott Lake, um, which is up up hills and so forth, and looking at the northern lights uh, over the tops of the roofs on a summer night, uh, which is kind of a magical thing. <laughs> And you know, it's and I, I feel this felt this overpowering love for, her, but I couldn't say I feel an overpowering love for you. <laughs> the universe had to demonstrate it to her and had to demonstrate it in the poem. So there's the there's the sky and there's the stars and the hills are rising to meet the lights and everything. You know, and um that's that's how you make feelings work. That right. it's it, it's uh, Elliot calls it the objective correlative, which is kind of like a a t very T.S. Eliot thing to say, you know, very dry. But the whole point is that feelings and things have to sit on some sort of um, um, realistic basis. And you, yeah, yeah. you get to talk about the express them through concrete images. And then the feelings amplify because they're they're plugged into something. They're part of reality. So exactly. They're, they're genuine. Yeah. What uh, um, are you going to read anything? Because you did ask. If yes. You Yes, I'll, I'll read you a poem. This is from um, from Church Grammar. This is okay. the new book. And I think you saw, I sent you an electronic copy. Of this. So I'll send you the hard yeah, copy you of your collection. Um, this is a poem. Um, and I, I never thought much about this poem. It sort of slipped into the book. And a colleague of mine, she I sent her a copy. And she said, I love that poem. That's like the best poem. You've and I thought, really? So anyways, I went back and I thought, yeah, okay. So I'm happy with it now. So, so I wasn't <laughs> happy with it originally. This is titled An Afterlife for Language. After my final grades have been submitted, there's a week between terms when I wake late, pour myself some coffee, and stare out the kitchen window at the birds we trapped purple finches by the flock, a pair of cardinals, and a red wing I can hear but haven't seen. They remind me no one is entirely alone, that even when the winter term has gone, others will follow within a week. Summer, fall, the questions that seldom change because language works to stay the same, plays by the rules of its spectator sport, its grammar, spelling, syntax, and the greatest hits of fine punctuation. My favorite mark is an ellipsis, the echo that never made a sound, the mysterious ellipsis wandering off to die in the misery of an Arctic, Antarctic snow. I'm going out and shan't be long. The unspoken story that is understood, the bravest of misplaced intentions I hear each time I teach a course online and my keystrokes don't appear on screen, but are gathered by angels as windfall apples, free to anyone who dares to taste them, despite bruises, blemishes, and little green worms, and flaws they acquire from falling hard, rolling to their rot in knee-high grass. The kitchen window is open just enough to admit the jibes of chickadees who claim life is what it is and living a blessing, the natterings and a living blessing, uh, the natterings of eternal gratitude, a song for an unwritten season. My wife scattered seed on our patio, and birds have gathered in the hydrangea shrubs to learn whether words have an afterlife if they find no purpose here. Wow. So afterlife of language. Language does have an afterlife, you know. And it, you know, it came from the idea that I thought when you read a poem, this is something about poetry readings that I always find disappointing. They're not recorded and nobody's saving them. And the best culture, I think, in our society is, is found in poetry readings. And you can't hang it on a wall. It's not going to be an artifact. It just goes off into the void. Yes. And um, you know, I think that uh, I wonder, you know, where does it go? You know, uh, it's and it's not recorded. And but I think that there could be an afterlife of language that, you know, words live somewhere, somewhere they go somewhere happy, you know, so. Yeah, well, it, and it takes a certain. A certain uh, kind of person to 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 write it. 
and, and, and have it published because uh, I may read one of your books, um, I don't know, maybe a couple of years from now or down the road a couple of a couple of weeks. And and I'll 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 be I'll fit in into that moment when you're when you're almost pouring out your soul uh, with your writing, uh, your emotions also obviously, but with, with poetry I feel it it's, it's, it preserves for me it preserves those those rare moments that we have clarity. And we can write them down. Some of us will understand, some won't. But those that understand it, it will stick with them. And, and like you said, it doesn't have to be on a wall. It doesn't have to be framed. It's nice if they do that. But those those moments when when we are writing and we think this is something that we're doing on, on our own, I think it's a mixture of all the things that are happening while we're living that that gives us the power or the urge to put it on paper and to and, and somehow preserve it, and the uh, it, it surprises me, uh, Bruce, that the volume of books that you've written and none of them I uh, like. That that's oh, thank you. I, I I tried not not to do the same thing over again. You know, it's um, I mean I you know, sometimes I've started writing something. I think been there, done that. You know, and it's it, it just seems repetitive so I, I try to do something different every time out and uh, um, you know it, it's it's more of a challenge when I write fiction because you know I, I'm aware of what worked in a previous story but I gotta re, I gotta invent the story every time I start writing and it's true for poetry it's true for books you have to invent the the art every time you set out it's kind of like a journey of, of discovery so yeah. Yeah, it shows. Um, it, it it shows that 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 your creativity is is like almost ne never ending. It, it'll 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 remain for as long as we're here. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, absolutely. That, but when I see, I'm I'm impressed. I'm I'm, but I, I'm not the only one. Uh, oh, but then you, to, to know you, mm -hmm. the the few times that we met and we've been with each other in, in Nuevo León, you're the most down to earth person. You know, like I don't know, I you love, don't care about you. Well, I've written twenty books. You know, I love the fellowship of literature. You yeah. know, and I, you know, I, I don't know. It's um, being among writers. It's like if I if I was to talk about the books, another writer could go, yeah, 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 I write books too, sort of thing. There's <laughs> nothing. There's nothing I can discover about the other person, and I found that. Going to Lenati's, I, I just discovered things. Other people taught me so much just sitting there, and um, I want—I'm I, a bit of a sponge. And being among other authors just gave me a, a tremendous high, you know. It was a happy high, you know. And um, I, I, I learned so much, you know, just by chatting with people, and, you know. And there's a there was a kind of contemplative quality to the whole thing, and. Um, you know, uh, going for walks with Karen Shenfeld, for instance, yeah. and I kept saying, what's the, what's the Spanish word for that? What's the Spanish word for this <laughs> and that? And I was writing it all down, you know, everything that. And, um, you know, she, I, the word plaza, I didn't know that a plaza in Mexico is something other than a plaza here, at like a strip mall, you know, right. in, on the outskirts of town, you know. And, um, you know, so I was just, just the excitement of discovering that that's what Tula, uh, Tulanates was about. It was all about, you know, just discovering someplace new. And, um, you know, I Mexico, when, when I got there, I was I was blown away by it because it, I, I said to um, Colin, I said to a number of other people, Mexico was life with the volume turned up. You know, I said the colors are brighter, the yes. everything was louder, everything was more effusive. You know, and I, I come from Canada, and we do gray really well here. I mean, it's uh, you know, uh, our, uh, when I met Pierre Trudeau, who was our famous prime minister, I was I was a kid in 1968. And we went to Ottawa and he came down the stairs to meet our group of people in the House of Commons and uh, in the foyer of the House of Commons uh, in our parliament. And 
he signed my autograph book. And my grandmother said, well, what did you think of Pierre Trudeau? And I said, he is the greatest man I've ever met. And his hair was gray. His eyes were gray. His suit was gray. And his skin was gray. And it was almost like he was like a black and white television standing there. And this is the guy who was the, who in many ways, historically, was the most flamboyant of our prime ministers. Oh, really? Yeah. And the prime minister, when I was born, was a gentleman called Louis Saint Laurent. And Papa, Grandpa Louis, as he was called. And you know what he was known for? He fell asleep in the middle of one of his own speeches. He, he was elderly, and he'd been waiting for Mackenzie King to, to resign <laughs> and to step aside. And he'd been waiting for about 40 years, and he finally got to be prime minister. And he went, <laughs> in the middle of one of his own speeches. You know, and the people on the oh. platform were going, wake him up. Well, what should we do, you know? So, true. but we do gray. We do gray well here. So uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a it, it's it's a world of his own, and I, I remember how how comfortable I felt among those other writers. That was the first time that I had been to a gathering where everyone had published some material, and then we sat down for coffee, lunch, whatever it was, and everyone was so excited to be around the other people too. And yeah. like you said, we were, became sponges. You know, it was. Um, I remember when you, I think you, you and uh, Albert Pellissier had been up to Galliano. Okay. You'd been over the mountains, and you came back, and you were drenched in sweat because it was a <laughs> boiling hot day. And and uh, Albert said, you know, Albert was just blown away. He was from Spain, so he should have done boiling yeah, yeah. hot really well. But um, he was he was actually blown away by by the heat and by the yes. the intensity of the experience. And then the next year. Um, when my daughter was with me, um, Jonathan Mann, who was a British poet, um, yes, been... and we we were driven over the mountains and to to Galliano, and um, it it was part terrifying, you know, because there was there was goats in the road, and the yeah. road dropped four hundred feet, and my daughter was like she was, was sitting scary. in the back seat, yeah. but she had her had her fingers in my back of my neck. <laughs> and um, I think she left bruises, and um, it was it was exciting, oh. and that's that's that's, and of course there's something to write about, you know. And yeah. I think the thing from the second trip that affected me the most was uh, Iturbide. Um, we went, we stopped in Iturbide um, one afternoon, and it was about five thirty, and there was a dance, a, a teenage dance in the civic hall. Yes, and there was um, um, and then it was we went into the church, and it was cool and it was calm in there. And then a woman came out to ring the bell, but the rope for the right. bell runs down the outside of the building, and she rang the bell. And I remember sitting in the square listening to the bell and watching as people came out of their houses and filed up to the the church, <laughs> and thinking this is beautiful. This is a moment of of of, of sublime. Um, it was spirituality that yes, uh, it, it, it was very spiritual. It was yeah. Yeah, so. I, uh, I remember that, I remember that. It, it, and I and I enjoyed every every moment we were there. Bruce, yeah. um, our our time is up. Um, oh. uh, I will invite you again in the future. Uh, I haven't touched on, on anything really that I thought I was going to ask, but let me give the people your phone number in Canada in the event uh, they want to get in contact with you. Seven zero five. 896 2304. That's myself. And the, yeah. and the email is Bruce B R U C E dot Mayer M E Y E R at Simpatico S Y M P A T I C O dot C A Canada. Um, and if you if you if you can't reach them there, then, then reach out to me. I'm gonna invite you again. I thank you very much. You're Thank you for having me, Luis. It'd be great to see you. Come on up and see us sometime. We, you, you've been invited yeah. me from the first time I met you, and for one reason or another, I haven't done it yet. But I promise that I will. I will because I want to. You and and and, um, and uh, Sharon and and uh, and all those that I met. Thank you very much, and God bless my brother. You Take too. Care. Have a good one. Thanks. Go see to you the later. lady and to your daughter. Thank you. Take care. Ciao. Bye. 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 Yeah. Uh -huh.